Good afternoon and uh, welcome. I hope you will find um, this presentation uh, informative and entertaining. Um, we are going to talk about a fairly broad range of topics. Um, and to give you a broad outline, we're going to talk about changing sleep patterns in modern times, the effect of the COVID pandemic on sleep. Um, we'll talk about normal and disturbed sleep um, and highlight uh, two sleep disorders, one common and one less common. And uh, that will all set the stage for the balance of the presentation on insomnia causes and how to sleep better. So it's been increasingly recognized in the medical community that sleep is an important lifestyle contributor to health along with exercise and diet. Uh, this is a quotation from the Journal of the American Heart Association. Sleep is very important to health and well-being. It's needed for optimal functioning, for alertness, learning and memory, judgment and decision-making. A lack of adequate sleep regularly may contribute to chronic health problems such as cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, weight gain, and depression. Insufficient sleep may impair reaction time and contributes to increased accidents of all kinds. Uh, putting it much more bluntly, one medical journal recently said that too little sleep leads to an unambiguous and consistent pattern of increased risk of dying. So what is the state of sleep in America in 2023? America is not sleeping well. Why aren't Americans sleeping well? Not enough time, too much work, too much worry, too much light, too many toys like video games, a number of sleep disorders, and lastly, the COVID pandemic. A recent, recent surveys before the pandemic showed that 50%, more than 50% of Americans report sleeping less than seven hours a night, and about 30% of Americans report sleeping less than six hours a night. In fact, the duration of sleep has been declining in the last uh, 13 years. You can see a steady uh, decline with a loss of almost 10 minutes. And this is continuing a pattern for the last century with a declining sleep from an average of about nine hours in 1910 to under seven hours by 2005. A large contributor to this problem has been increased light exposure or what we call light pollution. If you look at a satellite image of the earth at night before the 1960s, you saw darkness across the face of the earth. But if you looked in, in the present millennium over, over the surface of the earth at night is all lit up. And a lot of this comes down to an invention by the man at the bottom of the screen, Thomas Edison, when he invented the incandescent light so that we now have the introduction of light during the nighttime. Along with this trend of decreased sleep, there's been a parallel and opposite trend of increased weight. If you look at the graph, you see that just around the same time as the sleep time has declined, there have been a marked increase in obesity. In fact, multiple studies have shown that less than seven hours of sleep is associated with an increased risk of obesity, as well as heart disease, stroke, diabetes, and depression. The graph, the, 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 the tabular data shows the difference in the incidence uh, for people sleeping less than seven hours compared to over seven hours for a number of serious uh, medical conditions. Now the introduction of the pandemic has caused an even worsening of sleep. In fact, many have used the term that we have a second pandemic called coronasomnia. What coronasomnia represents is a marked increase in disturbed sleep or difficulty sleeping across the entire population. For most people, it's been a worsening of sleep, although some people have benefited with the opportunity for more sleep with less commuting time and more flexible work schedules. The prevalence of sleep pro problems in the pandemic in the general population was surveyed in a very large study of almost a half a million people across 49 countries. 
and they found the global pan the global prevalence of difficulty sleeping at over 40 percent and this held across all subgroups all measures in all countries for COVID-19 patients over 50 percent problem sleeping for children and adolescents um, 46 percent for healthcare workers 42 uh, percent these rates of disturbed sleep increased during the lockdowns and the rate worsened from 2020 to 2021 across all different um, uh, complaints and symptoms of sleep. Uh, we're seeing an increase in sleep problems from before to during the pandemic, whether it's poor quality sleep, uh, early morning awakening, nightmares, use of, of medications to sleep and so forth. What are the reasons? Uh, multiple reasons, uh, stress, fear and anxiety, particularly about getting sick with COVID. Many people face loss of employment and financial burdens. Confinement has led to reduced exposure to daylight. Uh, social isolation has contributed to depression. Uh, an increased use of computers with screen time, whether it's for work or school, uh, has, has caused disturbances. Um, a loss of daily routines uh, and an increase in the use of alcohol and other substances. So what are those sleep changes that have been noted across the, uh, the, the, uh, the general population? Uh, a, a general later bedtime, a later wake up time, so a shift in the sleep schedule, increased dreaming. And this is actually even greater than occurred after the 9-11 uh, tragedy. Um, vivid dreams and nightmares are seen frequently in COVID patients, especially if it's severe or, or people uh, hospitalized in intensive care. Uh, nightmares uh, are also more common among, amongst the frontline healthcare workers, and insomnia and fatigue are more common in people with long COVID. So let's talk about sleep, both normal and disturbed sleep. For adequate rest, all three of the following trio are needed, adequate quantity, quality, and timing. And we're going to expand on these uh, a, a, a great deal. Quantity, well, the amount of sleep that's needed depends on the age, but for adults, uh, the, the optimal amount appears to be seven to nine hours for most people. Sleep quality, there can be a variety of things that can disrupt sleep externally, light, noise, heat, or cold, medical problems such as lung disease or back pain, and sleep disorders, for example, muscle twitches uh, in, in, the, um, in the legs during sleep can disturb sleep. Sleep timing is important. So sleep and wake are regulated by an internal biological clock that has a 24 hour rhythm we call the circadian rhythm. Sleep is best when it's aligned with the biological night, when the brain says you should be sleeping um, with the sun. And misalignment of our biological clock with the external time can occur in a number of situations. Jet lag occurs with plane travel uh, where the biological clock is, remains on the home time. And social jet lag uh, is basically getting up later on the weekends than on the weekdays. Normal sleep is about a third of our day. And normally people are awake during the daytime hours where there's sun exposure and they're asleep during the night uh, during periods of darkness. Sleep itself is not homogeneous, but we cycle through a number of different stages through wake stages one through three, and then uh, the stage called REM or rapid eye movement where there's vivid dreams. And we normal, normally cycle through these several times during the night. Well, what regulates sleepiness and wakefulness? Two factors are primarily responsible. One is there's a biologic need or drive for sleep, which is like an appetite uh, or a pressure to sleep. And the second is the biological clock, which works on a 24 hour rhythm of wakefulness and, and sleepiness. And you can see uh, graphed how the, the circadian rhythm uh, is a wave that, uh, that, that, that waxes and wanes, whereas the drive or the biologic drive to sleep, we call the homeostatic drive, it builds when you're not sleeping and then it drops rapidly as soon as you have sleep. So the biologic drive builds up steadily since the last time that there was sleep and the circadian alerting drive depends on the time of day, humans being programmed to be alert in the daytime with sunlight and sleepy during darkness. If you merge these two graphs to get the sum effect, 
it looks something like this, like the like the shape of a of an elephant's profile, where the overall alertness remains relatively high throughout the day, with a little dip during the siesta times, and remains relatively low during the night during the sleep time. So the first half of the night we sleep because of a buildup of the biologic drive because we haven't slept in sixteen hours, and then the second half of the night we stay asleep because the circadian alertness is very low. So what can go wrong with sleep? Well, in any of those three spheres, quantity, sleep deprivation or insomnia, quality, sleep disorders such as sleep apnea, and timing are disorders of the biological clock like jet lag. So we'll talk about each of these. So what causes reduced sleep duration? A variety of things, medical problems such as heart and lung disease, pain, something called restless leg syndrome, which is a urge to move the legs or the arms during the night that keeps people awake. A number of drugs and medications can reduce sleep, caffeine, allergy, and cold medications. Some psychiatric disorders, particularly anxiety and depression and stress. And then insomnia can lead to sleep loss. And many, some of these are due to behavioral causes, things that people are doing. And then there's something called chronic or primary insomnia, uh, where there's no real cause other than that the individual is, has what we call hyperarousal. Now, important to emphasize that insomnia is not the same as sleep deprivation. Sleep deprivation is a situation where someone is able to sleep. They just don't have enough opportunity to sleep. They're lurking, working um, long hours, for example. Insomnia is someone who's not able to sleep even with adequate opportunity. So some examples of newer recently identified uh, causes of insomnia can be due to 24-hour television. Uh, which is basically a situation of poor sleep hygiene. And a newly uh, named condition, orthosomnia, which is insomnia due to an excessive preoccupation with um, improvable sleep tracking data. So it's due to a, a perfectionist quest to get perfect data that people have been uh, obsessing about and keeping themselves awake in the process. So we mentioned before that there's a link, but it turns out that there's increasing scientific data that insufficient sleep leads to weight gain and obesity. So if you want to lose weight and you're not sleeping enough, it's probably going to be easier for you to just get more sleep than to stay up and exercise. In terms of sleep uh, quality, there are over 85 recognized sleep disorders that will affect sleep quality. So we're going to highlight two of these that are one of one is very common sleep apnea and the other less common REM sleep behavior disorder. So sleep apnea, as I said, is very common, uh, estimated five to 20 percent of the population or about 30 million Americans in the ages from 50 to 70, 17 percent of men and nine percent of women. It involves snoring with repetitive apneas, which are stop breathing interruptions during sleep that can occur dozens to hundreds of times each night. What happens with sleep apnea is there's a drop in the muscle tone in the throat muscles during sleep, which leads to a blockage or obstruction of the airway. So people stop breathing and that's what an apnea is. Each apnea causes a drop in blood oxygen level and at the same time, a surge of adrenaline. These adrenaline surges cause a rise in heart rate and blood pressure and also a brief awakening. These brief awakenings occur many times and they disrupt sleep and they cause people to be sleepy or poorly rested. At the same time, the surges of adrenaline and the drops in oxygen level are very stressful to the heart and the brain. A number of symptoms of sleep apnea, snoring, gasping, visible apneas, waking up at night, uh, dry mouth, morning headache, and so forth. Sleep apnea does have a significant effect on both health and lifestyle. The poor sleep leads to poor quality of life and also an increased uh, rate of accidents. And the cardiovascular stress leads to high blood pressure, arrhythmias, heart attacks, and strokes. So significant health risks uh, from untreated sleep apnea, which are reduced or eliminated uh, with treatment. So our main treatment for the last 40 years 
uh, has been CPAP. It's safe, effective, and non-invasive. And basically, it involves uh, air pressure that holds the airway open. In 2023, we have more and more uh, CPAP machines that are smaller and quieter and more effective, a number of varieties. You can see that the size uh, has come down to small handheld uh, uh, units. Um, and these are uh, markedly improved from the units that we used to have uh, only five or 10 years ago. Uh, there's been an explosion in CPAP mask types, primarily about having more comfort. So these can be over the nose, under the nose, or in the nose. They can be made of many different types of material from cloth to memory foam. But admittedly, CPAP is not for everyone. It may be uncomfortable. In some people, it disturbs their sleep. Some people find it just too cumbersome. And so we have a variety of, of alternatives. CPAP therapy still, with its multiple types, uh, is used in about 80 85% of people, but we also have oral appliances used maybe in 10% and, and a number of other options, which I'll briefly show you. So one of the newer treatments is a nasal valve uh, that's worn in the nose that uh, creates back pressure uh, that's similar to CPAP, but there's no, no machine, no tubing, no hoses. Uh, basically just what you see there is a small valve that goes in the nose. This is primarily for mild sleep apnea, and it would not be suitable for a mouth breather. Oral appliances have improved over the years. Um, they are very lightweight and they um, fit in the mouth comfortably. They're molded to the teeth and these can be used for mild to moderate sleep apnea. One of the newer treatments is called neuromuscular electrical stimulation. And basically it involves a, a low level of electric current that's applied to the tongue with a small handheld device controlled with a smartphone. Uh, it's a daytime treatment, not during sleep, 20 minutes a day for six weeks, and it improves the muscle tone in the tongue. And this is again for mild sleep apnea or snoring, uh, and it's fairly effective in those uh, situations. Surgery uh, is generally not the first treatment for sleep apnea. About 5% of people with sleep apnea are treated with some surgical procedure. Advances in surgery recently have improved the outcomes uh, with less and less invasive uh, types of procedures. One of the newest and most popular procedures currently is hypoglossal nerve stimulation. You might have seen advertisements for this. It goes under the name of Inspire. That's a, the, a one brand of this. And basically it's a surgical implant that stimulates the nerve to the tongue during sleep so that it prevents apneas by moving the tongue forward. It is effective in patients where the tongue is the source of the apnea, which is about 80% of patients. Moving on to a less common sleep disorder, uh, called REM behavior disorder. It is actually more common than we previously thought. It affects about 1% of the population and about 5% of people over 60. So normally when REM sleep occurs, which is when there's dreaming, there's a loss of muscle tone, which prevents movements when you're dreaming and prevents you from uh, uh, developing uh, injuries. Well, some people lack the normal loss of muscle tone and they will have movements during their dreaming sleep and they will actually act out dreams. As you can see with this uh, depiction, this uh, individual is dreaming about boxing and he's punching uh, in the bed. Unfortunately, many of these people have violent dreams and so they'll have violent movements which can cause injury. Injury can occur from falling out of bed from punching a wall or from punching a spouse. This condition is extremely common in Parkinson's disease and Lewy body disease, uh, or also known as Lewy body dementia. Uh, you may recall this is what uh, Robin Williams uh, uh, passed away from. Um, and interestingly, um, REM behavior disorder, moving with dreams, can actually precede the development of Parkinson's disease and Lewy body uh, dementia by as much as 10 or 20 years, an average of about 12 years. Fortunately, uh, this condition is effectively treated with medications and exercise may reduce the progression if someone has uh, these movements, may reduce the chances of it progressing to Parkinson's disease. 
Moving on to sleep timing issues or circadian rhythm disorders. I mentioned jet lag is a situation where the brain is out of its usual time. It takes about one day to adjust for every time, every hour of time zone change. A social jet lag involves sleeping later on the non-work days. If you vary the wake up time, uh, your schedule is irregular and the brain will choose the later time. So people who sleep in on the weekends, the brain gets set for the weekend and then they have a hard time getting up early on the, uh, or and going to sleep on the weekdays. Shift workers work at night, they sleep during the day, and they have difficulty adjusting. It is virtually impossible to switch back and forth. Then we have two conditions that are actually fairly common. Delayed sleep phase syndrome are individuals where the biological clock is set late so that the individual goes to bed late and gets up late. We see this fairly commonly in adolescents. The opposite is advanced sleep phase where the biological clock is set early. These people will go to bed early at seven or eight o'clock in the evening and then wake up early at say three or four in the morning. And this is common in older age. So sleep and circadian health really depends on having an alignment of the biological clock with the solar clock, the, the sun, and social time. When all three are aligned, uh, people are able to sleep better. Unfortunately, they're not always aligned. Artificial light causes a delay in the biological clock. It makes us go to sleep later and get up later. Solar time only changes with the time zone changes, which we just went through, but social time can be uh, pushed earlier by an early work start. Sleep timing is really important. So a recently published study showed that inconsistent sleep timing or length increased the risk of developing coronary atherosclerosis and peripheral vascular disease. We have known for some time that shift workers have an increased risk of heart attacks and diabetes and metabolic syndrome and high blood pressure and even breast cancer. Uh, the time shift uh, in the spring from standard to daylight savings time that we just went through has been shown to be associated with increased risk of heart attacks, strokes, and motor vehicle accidents. And there is increasing evidence that daylight savings time is associated with an increased risk for obesity uh, and heart disease. It appears the human biological clock is more aligned with the sun during standard time than during daylight savings time. Unfortunately, there's some current legislation to adopt daylight savings time as the permanent uh, schedule. And that's probably the, the, the worst of the three options. We're probably better off switching as we do now and probably best off if we could stay permanently on, um, uh, on standard time. So how do we evaluate a patient's um, sleep? Let's just take a moment to, to, to talk about that. Um, we have a number of different ways of studying uh, patients who are having difficulty. We have what we call the in-laboratory study or polysomnography, which is a very comprehensive analysis of sleep. We monitor many different physiologic parameters. There are also home studies and there are several types, but these focus mostly on monitoring breathing. So they really can only diagnose sleep apnea. And then there's other specialized types of studies that we don't have time to talk about um, today. But I do wanna highlight that home studies are not the same as an in-laboratory study uh, by a long shot. There are a few advantages to home studies. They're less expensive. They're easier to get approved by insurance. They may be more convenient for patients and speed up the time to get treatment if it's sleep apnea. There's some question about they may reflect uh, uh, better what it's like sleeping at home, but there are many disadvantages as well. Home studies are subject to much more interference from electricity at home, pets and children. There is a higher failure rate and there's no feedback until the study's done. So there's nothing that can be done about it and other than do it over. Um, they're less accurate with diagnosing uh, uh, sleep apnea. They can underestimate or overestimate it. They only monitor breathing and oxygen level and they don't monitor sleep stages or sleep quality. Uh, they can only diagnose sleep apnea and yet they're not sensitive enough to rule it out. Um, and they cannot diagnose any other sleep disorder or adjust any treatment. So it is uh, a, a vastly different um, entity. So let's talk about chronic insomnia syndrome. So what that uh, it consists of is either difficulty initiating sleep, difficulty falling asleep, or difficulty maintaining sleep, difficulty staying asleep. When it's for 
three nights a week for three months, then we use the term chronic insomnia condition. In addition, no other cause should be present, such as restless leg syndrome, where the legs are keeping people up, or delayed sleep phase, where it's simply a matter that the sleep cycle is late. So two broad types of insomnia have been distinguished. Insomnia with short sleep time, this is where there's less than six hours of sleep as objectively documented by sleep studies. And this is a hyperarousal condition. People actually have high cortisol levels 24 hours a day. So it's really it's a 24 hour condition. Um, it does have increased medical consequences, as I mentioned before, high blood pressure, diabetes, for example. And then there's insomnia with normal sleep time. So objectively, um, there's, there's less than six hours of sleep. So this is a situation where there's actually something we call sleep state misperception. The reduced sleep is purely subjective. It's, it's not present when we actually monitor people. Um, and this condition responds much better to a treatment that we call cognitive behavioral therapy. So insomnia has significant impact. It impairs the quality of life. It has health effects. It lowers the pain threshold. So people will experience increased pain. Um, there are increased accidents um, in uh, uh, the workplace or, or with driving. Uh, there's absenteeism. People are miss work more and what we call presenteeism. They're present, uh, but their job performance is, is poor. And there is an increased risk of later psychiatric problems, particularly depression. There are a number of daytime symptoms. People who have uh, chronic insomnia feel primarily the uh, fatigue or low energy, uh, and actually much more than they complain about being sleepy. Um, they have problems with attention and concentration and memory. Uh, there's impairments in uh, social functions and, and performance at work, uh, disturbed mood, they're irritable. Uh, there are behavioral problems, particularly um, impulsivity and aggression. Um, People feel less motivated. They are more prone to making errors and they have a general dissatisfaction with their sleep. We have several different approaches to treating uh, chronic insomnia. Sleep medications, something we call cognitive behavioral therapy, and then some unconventional treatments that I'll, I'll, I'll describe uh, briefly that I call the three M's, melatonin, meditation, and marijuana. So Americans are using sleeping pills a surprisingly 20% of the time. 20% of Americans uh, take them regularly or at least occasionally. Uh, but evidence suggests that sleeping pills increase health problems and possibly even uh, mortality. Um, some of you may recall in 1962, Judy Garland passed away from an overdose of sleeping pills. So there are the older medications. Alcohol, unfortunately, causes very poor sleep, was used uh, a long time ago for people. Some people still uh, use alcohol to help them sleep. Uh, it doesn't. Um, barbiturates were the, in the early 20th century, and they uh, had a very high addictive potential and a lot of overdoses. And then came the benzodiazepines in the 60s, like Valium. Um, but these older medications do have frequent side effects, overdoses, and they are um, addictive. Newer sleeper medications do have less side effects. They are more effective and safer, and they tend to be more targeted to the timing of the insomnia, whether it's difficulty falling asleep uh, versus difficulty um, maintaining sleep. Um, and um, newer types um, will focus on inhibiting wakefulness rather than uh, 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 pre uh, in impressing um, uh, uh, sleepiness. These are medications like the Vigo or, or Belsamra, uh, which, which may work better in people who have hypervigilance. Sleeping pills of all sorts do have the potential for side effects. We see more um, falls uh, during the night. People get up uh, to use the bathroom, and the, if they've had sleeping pills, they may be unsteady. Um, Sleep walking and, and sleep eating can occur from almost any uh, uh, sleeping pills. It's been reported uh, most with, with Ambien, but it, it, it has 
It has been present um, with many others as well. Um, they can have a spillover into the daytime so that there's daytime sleepiness in, in some patients. Um, they do tend to get less effective over time. And so patients uh, will start escalating the dose. If five milligrams doesn't work, they'll take 10. When 10 doesn't work, they increase to 15 and so forth. There is an, a tendency towards dependence and addiction, even with the newer medications, although less so than the older ones. And then there's this question about an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. So I want to talk about that. There was a study that just uh, was published um, in, in the last month or so of uh, 3,000 older adults who did not have dementia, and they were followed for nine years. 20% of them developed dementia. And what they noticed was that among the white participants, there was a 79% higher chance of getting dementia in those who took sleeping pills compared to those who did not. And oddly enough, there was no difference noted in the rate of dementia in black participants uh, who took sleep aids. Uh, but incidentally, black, uh, 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 tend, black people tend to take sleep aids less often uh, and yet more often develop um, dementia. So it's a, whether there's a genetic or other reasons for this, we don't really understand it. But nevertheless, this was a, 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 an observation uh, amongst the white participants. So the question arises is, uh, do sleeping pills really cause Alzheimer's disease? Is it the sleeping pills themselves? Or is it the type of person who takes the sleeping pills? Or is it the people who have access to sleeping pills, which is, which is subject to uh, uh, economic status and insurance? Or is it the reduced uh, or poor sleep itself or is it people who are already developing Alzheimer's disease who have insomnia? And it turns out it is probably the last two. It is the reduction or poor sleep, and it is people who are developing Alzheimer's disease over 10 or 20 years before they even show the signs of it that will have insomnia. So it turns out that reduced sleep itself is linked to Alzheimer's disease. It probably isn't the medications. Alzheimer's patients' brains have a deposit of what's called beta amyloid, and less sleep does lead to an accumulation of amyloid. It seems to be clear during sleep. Um, and reduced sleep or fragmented sleep have both been shown to increase amyloid deposits in the brain. So the question that is the final question is, is the accumulation of amyloid the cause? And more and more evidence is suggesting that that may be the case. So let's talk about the treatment of insomnia. The two conventional treatments are medications and cognitive behavioral therapy. Just to compare them, medications versus cognitive behavioral therapy. Medications have a quick, immediate benefit. Um, patients intuitively understand that take a pill, it's going to help you sleep. So the acceptance rate is very high for most people. There is the problem of adverse effects, particularly daytime sleepiness and falls, and the problem of no exit strategy. When you take a sleeping pill, it's helping you for one night, and you're in the same situation the next night. So it really hasn't changed anything other than giving you that one night of sleep. Cognitive behavioral therapy has more of a delay in the benefit. It's a course of treatment. It takes time till it shows its effect and the benefits um, become uh, more and more uh, uh, noticeable. Uh, in some cases, the recommendations are counterintuitive. People resist it because it just doesn't sound like it's the right thing. It sounds like it's going the wrong direction. You mean if I do something that's going to hurt my sleep, it's going to help me sleep? It doesn't seem to make sense. A lot of skepticism and sometimes resistance. The main effect, however, of cognitive behavioral therapy is to increase sleepiness at night, which is what people need to do. So let's talk about cognitive behavioral therapy. It begins with what we call good sleep hygiene. So this is getting all the ducks in, in, in order. So it involves not having caffeine late in the day because caffeine inhibits sleep, avoiding alcohol and nicotine within three, four hours of bedtime, doing relaxing activities before bed, staying away from stressful activities or exercise right before bed avoiding television, computers, and video games because those are stimulating both the light and the content inhibit sleep, dimming the lights before bed, keeping the bedroom dark, quiet, and at a comfortable temperature. And then there's this. 
I am amazed how often people tell me that they sleep with their pets. Now, this might be extreme. I think there's at least four dogs in the bed in this picture. And you can see how that's disturbing somebody's sleep. Turns out that pets have different sleep patterns and they tend to move around uh, during the night. And then there's the concern that you might hurt the pet, hurt the uh, pet if it's a small animal. So no pets in the bed. That's a, a really uh, important thing. If, if people really feel like they need to have the pet close outside, outside the bed, but in the bedroom, it's actually best if the pet's really in another room. Um, watching the clock is a bad habit that a lot of people have who have trouble sleeping. It actually worsens the problem. Um, waking up the same time every day is critically important. That helps stabilize the biological clock. Getting sunlight exposure during the day, especially early, shortly after waking up. And finally, exercise is good for sleep as long as not within two hours. Exercise in the late afternoon or early evening can deepen sleep and help people fall asleep. So those are some cornerstone things that we call sleep hygiene, but it is not the same as cognitive behavioral therapy. So this is going beyond that. It's a non-medication approach. It involves changing behaviors as well as thinking to improve sleep. It has been proven in multiple scientific studies to be effective over 70% of the time at six months. And it's important that other sleep or psychiatric problems be identified and addressed either in advance or in conjunction with it. For example, uh, sleep apnea or depression. Cognitive behavioral therapy is not going to um, address or improve those kinds of things. So why does cognitive behavioral therapy work? Well, it does several things. One is it increases the natural sleep drive. We mentioned about sleep drive or sleep pressure. And if it's channeled, it can help you sleep. It improves the alignment of the biological clock with the time that you're in bed so that you're sleeping during your biologic night. It strengthens the bed as a cue to sleep. You want the bed to remind you of sleep and it will help you sleep as opposed to remind you, oh, this is where uh, I'm awake. This is where I'm anxious. And lastly, it reduces thoughts and behaviors that inhibit sleep. So we'll run through some of the principal uh, components of cognitive behavioral therapy. First, behavioral therapy things. Stop all activities in bed except for sleep. The sleep should be used only for sleep and sex. No reading, TV, computers, eating, work, worrying, etc. in the bed. You want the bed to be associated only with sleep. Second, don't remain in bed if you're awake for more than a half an hour or even sooner if anxiety is growing. And I mentioned before, don't watch the clock. So how does that work with a half an hour? Well, I say half an hour, not 30 minutes, because you know what a half hour feels like. It doesn't really matter if it's 20 minutes or 40 minutes. The point is it's more than five minutes. Give yourself a chance to fall asleep, but it's less than an hour. Don't torture yourself for hours. So in that rough, rough idea of about a half an hour, if you're not sleeping, it's best not to stay in bed anymore. Stop trying too hard to sleep. The harder you try, the more you won't. That's called performance anxiety. There was a strategy that was used in the past. We don't use it so much anymore called paradoxical intention. And it's the opposite of this. It's telling somebody, you know what? You're laying there. You can't sleep. Tell yourself, I'm going to try to stay awake. And in some cases, people will actually fall asleep because they're no longer trying to do that. Keeping to a regular sleep-wake schedule and critically getting up the same time every day. That means no sleeping in. You don't get a good night's sleep, you still have to get up. You don't stay in bed because I didn't sleep well. I'm going to sleep. I'm going to stay in bed another couple of hours. That is only going to create more, more problems sleeping. And getting sunlight or other light exposure in the morning. These both stabilize and strengthen the biological clock. Next, avoid napping in the daytime. This helps maintain that sleep drive, which is knocked down if you take a nap. Napping spoils your appetite for sleep. So also maintaining normal activity level. Some people, if they didn't have a good night's sleep, they just wallow in their tiredness. They just, all day long, that's all they're thinking about. It's best to just do your normal activity. Don't take a day off from work. Don't not go to school. Do whatever you normally would do. May be tough, but it actually, in the long run, is much better. And then relaxation. 
in the evening, it is best, especially if people have trouble relaxing, to have a 30 or 60 minute wind down time or routine time in dim light. And there could be a number of different techniques. Some people meditate, that's great. Breathing exercises are helpful and or, or relaxing music or, or a voice recording. Uh, the, the slide is showing a type of relaxation tape called progressive muscle relaxation, which involves tightening a muscle for five or 10 seconds and then releasing it and going through sequentially uh, many of the muscles in your body from head to toe. Part of cognitive behavioral therapy is the cognitive ther uh, therapy part. And this involves modifying beliefs that are not good beliefs. Now we call them dysfunctional beliefs because these are beliefs that are not conducive to sleep. They're not necessarily wrong. They may be scientifically accurate, but they're just counterproductive to be thinking about when you're trying to sleep. So here's an example of that where the brain is telling the body, oh, did you know not sleeping well causes a lot of health problems, even brain damage? And the body is saying, oh, this is not the time to be thinking about this. So there are some beliefs that are actually aren't even correct. So one of that involves what we call catastrophizing about one night of sleep loss. So a lot of people during the night are thinking, uh, oh, how bad it's going to be if I don't sleep well tonight. If I don't get a good night's sleep, I'm going to be sick or I'll be a wreck tomorrow. Now, in most cases, this is an exaggeration. It's usually not as bad as you imagine it to be. How many times did you not sleep that the next day you had a car crash or you got fired? Those are things that don't usually happen. Usually you just don't feel great. And usually you could you could plug through it. Also, there are inappropriate expectations. Some people will say, I have to always get eight hours of sleep. I should never wake up during the night. Or if I don't fall asleep now, I'm going to sleep through the alarm. Well, you know what? It actually is not abnormal to wake up during the night. So there are uh, uh, some modifications. Uh, people should recognize that it is... Um, very common that people will have an inaccurate estimate. I hear all the time people tell me they only slept one or two hours. And most of the time that's not actually accurate. People uh, who have insomnia usually sleep more than they think, uh, usually about an hour more, but sometimes it's a lot more if they have what we call sleep state misperception. It could be off by four or five hours. Realize it's not abnormal to awaken at night one or, or several times. When you, slip, when you uh, switch stages of sleep, there's often a brief awakening. Um, avoid exaggerated sense of dread about sleep and avoid thinking about absolutes. A lot of times what people do is they will label every night as either a good night or a bad night. And they say, look how few good nights I have. But actually, they're more often a gradations. And it's better to think about the quality of sleep on a scale of one to 10, uh, where a lot of things are not absolutely the worst. They may not be perfect but they're really in between nights. And so if you look at it that way, there are fewer bad nights. A lot of people have trouble sleeping because they worry during the night. And so what we recommend in that situation is to set aside a time, just schedule a time, 10 minutes or 15 minutes, preferably after dinner, find a, a specific place other than the bedroom and make a list of the worries that have kept you awake uh, on previous nights and make a plan on how to deal with them. Now, some things, relatively easy solution. You know, you have a leaky roof, uh, you're gonna call a, 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 roof, uh, a roofer to repair the roof. Some things, not so easy, right? Some things you don't have a solution for, right? The global pandemic or, uh, or, or global warming. So sometimes you just have to say, I, nothing I can do about that. You can't fix or change things that you can't you can't um, do something about. And so recognize that and write that down. Nothing I can do about that one. So you, now you've made your list and you put it aside. During the night, when these worries come up, you remind yourself, you know, I have a time to worry about this tomorrow or I've already done that today. This isn't the time. And it turns out, interestingly enough, that when you have a plan on dealing with issues, the worrier is easy to drop or it comes up less often uh, at night when you're in bed. A lot of people will say they just have a racing mind or their, their, their thoughts are just running away from one thing to another and that this is keeping them up. We're actually not sure if this is keeping them up or if they're having this because they're awake. 
uh, it's a chicken before the egg question, and it may be different in different people. So some people start having these kinds of thoughts. Um, what happens if I calculate how much time I will, I will get of sleep every few minutes that I don't sleep? Well, obviously, that's going to keep you awake. So how do you calm the racing mind? Well, it, first of all, the recognition that it's possible. It is possible to control your thoughts and your mind. You have to choose to do so. That's what mindfulness is all about, is emptying the mind of thoughts. Focusing on the present moment, not on the past or not on things that are or may or may not even happen in the future. Uh, in some cases, focusing on the breathing or on your senses or thinking of a peaceful image uh, like like floating in a boat on a lake. There are a number of apps and websites that can help for this. One is called um, headspace.com. Another is called Calm. Uh, that, that can give uh, sort of simple ways for, for, um, for guided meditation. So some practical aspects of cognitive behavioral therapy. One is it is best if it's guided or assisted by a health professional or by an online app. Um, the online apps, uh, I mentioned uh, there's um, uh, CBTI Coach, uh, which is a free app, and then Shut Eye and Sleepio, um, which uh, are uh, nominal uh, uh, costs that can help guide uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. But I want to highlight one aspect of cognitive behavioral therapy that, that, that is worth um, dwelling on a little bit more. I mentioned about that if you're not sleeping for a half hour or more, that you should get up um, and yet still maintain a constant wake-up time. This is important because it breaks the association of the bed with wakefulness as I mentioned earlier. Um, and it actually does enable a faster return to sleep when you do go back to bed. Um, eventually, over time, the bed will become associated with sleeping better um, and help you fall asleep. But I want to explain in a little more detail why it is bad to stay in bed. There's a lot of people who say, but I, I'm tired. I just want to stay in bed, so hopefully I'll get some sleep. And it turns out it's counterproductive. Number one, if you're awake, for extended periods, the bed will now become associated with anxiety and stress, and the bed itself will, will bring on those, the, those feelings. But the other, even more significant, is that long periods of time in bed while you're awake during the night, what actually happens is that you drift in and out of light sleep. We call it stage one sleep or transitional sleep, and yet you're not aware of it because in light sleep, there's some awareness of the environment. You are aware where you are. You might hear noises outside, a car going by, a voice, but you're actually in light sleep. The problem is that light sleep inhibits deeper, better sleep. I call it the junk food of sleep because if you got a lot of that, you got some sleep, it's not going to progress to deeper sleep, um, and yet you're not going to feel rested. Um, you're not going to feel like you had uh, um, uh, much sleep. Uh, and as I said, worst of all, it actually is going to fill up the night with with uh, with poorly restful sleep as opposed to deeper sleep. Once you pass from light sleep into deeper sleep, it's much more stable. You get locked in for hours. So people always ask the question, OK, so if I'm supposed to get out of bed during the night, what do I do? Right. And we can't leave that question unanswered. So there, there, there are strategies that work the best, some things that are good to do and some that are not good to do. What I recommend is sitting in a chair, but don't fall asleep there. The chair should be comfortable, but it shouldn't be bed. So it shouldn't be the kind of recliner that you're just going to sleep there. You just moved yourself from one place to another. Um, do something that's quiet and sedentary. Do not do video, not TV, computers, or, or, or tablets, or cell phones. Keep the lights dim because light inhibits sleep. Don't exercise or start doing chores or pay bills. Those are just going to be stimulating. And don't return to bed until you feel sleepy. Not when you just feel frustrated. You're not going to sleep if it's just frustration. But when you start to feel your eyes starting to close, that's when you go back to bed. Most people think that's not going to happen. Well, it will happen if you wait long enough. And worst case scenario, if one night it doesn't happen, what do you think happens the next night? Now you're going to be much more tired the next night if you didn't nap or sleep in, and you'll sleep much better. But that is actually something that very rarely ever occurs. So what do you do when you get out of bed? Well, doing something audio, right? Music, radio, audiobook, podcast. And go back to bed when you just can't stay awake any longer, not when you feel frustrated. And then, as I said, don't sleep in and avoid napping during the day unless you have to do something critical, like go for a long drive. 
If you're sleep deprived, which this does cause some sleep deprivation temporarily, which will help you sleep the next night. But if you're sleep deprived, that's not a good time to uh, drive a truck or uh, operate a tractor or do something you know that that is really a, a, a critical to have full alertness. So finally, I want to turn to some other more uh, research or experimental methods to treat insomnia. And I'll admit that most of these I don't have a lot of experience with, but just uh, for, for completeness, they're worth mentioning because they're things you may see pop up um, in, in the news. One is weighted blankets. So these seem to help some people sleep, particularly people who like to feel well tucked in or hugged. It's not for people who feel claustrophobic or they feel or they get overheated at night because it doesn't let for as much uh, uh, um, uh, heat to come off. Cooling turns out to be better for sleep than heat. Um, but there are people who swear by uh, weighted blankets. Forehead cooling. As I said, in sleep, it is normal to cool off, particularly the brain. And some studies have shown that um, cooling the head can help you sleep. So there is something called frontal cerebral thermal, thermal therapy, which is uh, cooling the front of the brain uh, with a cooling device. And there are a couple that are commercially available um, that can help people to, to fall asleep. Uh, a new thing that uh, was published recently um, is called acoustic stimulation or Hiram, high resolution relational resonance based EEG mirroring. And what it is is that the system um, monitors with uh, scalp senses the brain waves, the EEG, and with an algorithm, it analyzes that and then it produces tones of sound that correspond to those brain waves. So they say it's like the brain listening to itself. And these tones um, delivered with earbuds um, uh, have been shown to help some people um, to sleep. Melatonin, very commonly used. Um, and it is true that uh, natural endogenous melatonin, in other words, the melatonin that is in your brain, is involved in the sleep-wake cycle. And that with advanced age and dementia, there is melatonin deficiency. Um, but research on the use of melatonin for insomnia has mixed and mostly negative results. Um, there's been no benefit really shown across the board for primary insomnia, and it's not been recommended by the sleep societies. There are some situations it can be helpful. It can be helpful in circadian sleep disorders with jet lag or the delayed sleep phase syndrome. The adolescents who go to bed really late and get up earlier, it can help move their sleep cycle. For jet lag, if you take a small dose, um, close to the target destination bedtime, it may help you adjust um, to, um, to the new time zone. Melatonin is not without some negative effects. It can cause some daytime sleepiness. It does increase nightmares in a lot of people. If you have sleep apnea, it may worsen it. Um, it has been reported to cause seizures or to constrict blood vessels leading to some damage to some organs. So it's not completely um, benign. Other supplements, not going to go through all of these, but a lot of these have been studied, valerian, L-tryptophan, kava, kava, enough to say most of these have mixed or negative results, and a few of them have significant toxicity. L-tryptophan, there have been some fatalities. Kava, kava can cause um, permanent liver damage. It's banned in Europe. Um, uh, chamomile may have some modest benefits for some people, uh, the same with um, lavender and, and tart cher cherries. Uh, but most of these um, have um, uh, mixed or very minimal uh, benefit. Let's talk about briefly nutrition and sleep. So fruits and vegetables are good. Um, uh, people uh, with reduced fruit and vegetable intake seem to sleep less. Recommended five servings a day of berries, tomatoes, spinach, and so forth. Uh, Omega-3 fatty acids, um, fish, consumption uh, has been shown to improve some people's sleep. Uh, walnuts and flax seeds have um, omega fatty acids and supplements, uh, not more than a thousand milligrams a day. There is some uh, risk of, of, um, of bruising and bleeding uh, with omega-3 fatty acids. So it's not all, uh, all good, but um, uh, that can help some people sleep. Protein consumption uh, in, in uh, fish, uh, chicken, lean meat, and nuts. Um, nuts also have other um, 
uh, trace elements uh, like selenium and, um, and magnesium and copper, uh, the, some of which can help sleep. And gluten-free foods like brown rice, quinoa, and, and buckwheat. So these are some things that uh, can be beneficial to sleep and increasing your, your diet with these uh, may be uh, beneficial. There are also things to avoid. Obviously, caffeine, alcohol, and nicotine. Dark chocolate contains something called theobromine, um, which is a stimulant. Um, chocolate milk contains both theobromine and caffeine. Um, and so these can inhibit sleep. And then sugars and processed foods um, can disrupt sleep. Exercise, as I mentioned, exercise can help falling asleep and actually improves the efficiency of sleep in, in middle-aged and older adults. It does influence the circadian rhythm and can reduce um, stress and anxiety. Lack of activity does reduce the circadian rhythm and reduces melatonin release. The best time to exercise, somewhere around two to four, or two to six hours before bed. Meditation, very helpful in those people who can do it. Meditation, it's not what you think. Basically, meditation is not thinking, is just being. And if people can meditate, it empties their mind and can be very helpful. Finally, ending on a high note, let me talk a little bit about marijuana. So marijuana, there is a fair amount of research, but um, a lot of it is conflicting about the results, partly because um, the studies can't be blinded. Um, there can be cognitive impairment and flashbacks. Um, there is the potential for addiction. Um, there is some risk of pulmonary complications like um, triggering asthma, um, uh, cardiovascular disease and stroke can cause sleepiness in the daytime. And it's definitely not recommended for sleep apnea, although I've, people have touted that. So let's talk about there are different components in cannabis. Uh, the two principal psychoactive ones are THC, uh, tetrahydrocannabinol. That's what gives people the high. And natural marijuana has high concentrations of THC. It is usually sedating, but in some people it can be stimulating, um, especially if it's the first time somebody's used it or someone's had a very high dose of it. Um, the other component is CBD, uh, cannabidiol, which has high levels in the hemp plant, a little lower levels in natural marijuana. Um, low doses of that turn out to be stimulating or not effective at all, doses around 15 milligrams, but very high doses, getting up to around 160 milligrams a day, it does reduce arousals during sleep and increases sleep time. The problem with this is it's extraordinarily expensive. Um, to take 160 milligrams a day could cost 30 to $50 a day. In, in terms of, of what the effect of smoking or ingesting it, the exact combination of THC and CBD may determine the effect on sleep, and that may account for why there are you know, varying results in, in conflicting studies. What about situations where it can help? There are some. So patients with chronic pain, marijuana can help improve their sleep duration and quality. People with fibromyalgia, um, with uh, diffuse muscle um, uh, aches, uh, they've been shown to have improved sleep quality. People with post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, marijuana can reduce their nightmares, uh, probably because it reduces REM sleep. Um, what about regular use though? Um, so regular use of marijuana initially increases non-REM sleep. It does not increase REM, it may reduce it. But that's only the initial. After the first few days, it then reduces non-REM sleep below what it was before. So it looks as if acute use may help sleep one time, but chronic use may actually worsen sleep. And then there's the problem with withdrawal. People use it regularly when they stop using it, withdrawal, disrupts sleep, reduces sleep. And that seems to persist for a very long time after it's discontinued. So the benefit of marijuana well, varies really with the reason and how it's taken. More beneficial in chronic pain and post-traumatic stress where it may improve sleep and for rare or occasional use for insomnia with a lot of anxiety. But it's less beneficial or not beneficial if it's taken regularly to improve sleep in someone with insomnia. In, in, in adolescence, it seems to worsen sleep. And edibles seem to worsen sleep compared with, uh, with uh, smoking. So in conclusion, a few summary points. I've covered a lot of different issues. I just want to highlight a few of them. 
So sleep is important to health. Quality, quantity, and timing are all important. Societal changes, particularly increased light at night and the pandemic have seriously eroded sleep. Poor sleep can be improved by identifying and treating sleep disorders, by improving behaviors and understanding about sleep, and by maintaining a regular sleep-wake schedule. People with sleep problems should be evaluated professionally if they have frequent waking from sleep, if they're snoring with breathing disturbances, could be an indication of sleep apnea, or if they have unrefreshing sleep or daytime sleepiness. And finally, the Valley Sleep Center is here to help.